to uh, <coughs> capture stuff here that we're going over. Um, we did the autonomic system on Friday, so uh, we're moving on to the endocrine system lab today. Um, and really for this lab, uh, what we're concentrating on is what the endocrine tissues look like under the microscope. And um, we aren't going to be getting microscopes out um, just over the years as I've been doing this. Um, originally, I have uh, a big television monitor up front connected to a microscope, and I just run stuff on the screen, and students have their microscopes out. The television screen was not that great, uh, so having a microscope in front of you gave you a chance to actually see the tissue that we were looking at. Um, and then when we switched to having the projector system and this digital scope up front, um, <clears throat> I just replaced the um, television screen with the scope up here, uh, projecting this scope up here, and students still had their microscopes out. But what I, what I noticed is because they could see stuff on the screen pretty well, uh, students didn't tend to bother even looking through their microscopes. So I've just dispatched with that completely in this. Um, I've been capturing the images that I use uh, through the scope up here, so I have them. And right now I have the endocrine system chapter uh, folder up here, because uh, I want to point out to you that uh, there's a link down here. Where to go? Uh, it says endocrine system micrographs. Uh, so I've captured these images, and you have a link to the folder in the cloud where I keep them, so you can look at them on your own. Um, we'll be going through these pictures today uh, to understand about the endocrine tissue. Um, the, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, the slides, if you'd like to look at them in more detail, um, you're welcome to. These are all out of the yellow slide box. And let me just put this up here. Um, so we're going to be looking at, in slide number 11, the hypothesis. <laughs> slide number 12 is the thyroid and parathyroid glands. And 13 is the pancreas. And 14 is the adrenal gland. Um, I just put this up here so that if you'd like to look at these slides yourself, um, this is where to go, go to them. I'm going to be showing you these slides in this particular order. Um, <coughs> although I usually don't think to mention which slide number we're on. So here you have it uh, to look at. Um, if you'd like to look at these slides on your own, um, you are welcome to come in on Wednesdays when the other um, class is meeting. So if you want to come in tomorrow during the same time, they'll be in here doing, I think they're up to the heart now. Um, but uh, you're welcome to sit in the back row there um, while the class is going on. You can use the scopes here. Um, but if that time doesn't work for you, you can look at the microscope slides anytime you want to. Um, the uh, room down the hall, uh, 511, it's like where we have lecture next door to us, 512 is the study room with the round uh, tables um, for students to sit there and study. And then next to that is 511, which is where we keep all of the anatomy lab materials. Uh, basically a copy of everything that's in any of these labs, with a few exceptions. Um, so a &P students can study down there. Uh, we have microscopes. They're not even as nice as these. These are like, a, oh, I probably didn't tell you. Uh, in a and one uh, if you had me, I would have told you that these scopes were bought in 1987 uh, when we moved into this building. Um, the scopes that we replaced with these back in 1987, are down the hall, so they're very old scopes. Uh, they're not even, they don't have an internal light source, they have a separate light source. But other than that, they work on the same principles as these. Um, so you're welcome to use those. Uh, there's a yellow slide box down there uh, to look at, as well as um, the other slide boxes if you want to look at other things. 
Um, the rooms kept locked, uh, generally speaking, but uh, it's only used, it's only available for AP students to study in, so if you want to get in there, just uh, find myself or maybe one of my colleagues and we'll unlock the door for you. Um, and that's true all the time. If you need to get in and look at any of the lab stuff, it's down there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we're going to be looking at these slides uh, that are captured through the microscope here so that we can um, study them. And you'll have those available to look at whenever you want to uh, through the cloud service link. I have a link to you. So um, before we start looking at those slides, I just want to talk about uh, the fact that what's important to understand about these slides is a matter of how staining takes place. Um, hold on a sec. Now, um, the... Uh, process of staining is a little bit more involved than I'm going to get into. Uh, I'm going to simplify it so that we understand what's going on. And um, if you were to talk to a cell biologist or somebody who's familiar with staining technique, they kind of laugh at the steps I'm leaving out. But the concept is still basically the same. Um, if you were to take a slice of tissue um, and look at it in the microscope, just as it is, you wouldn't see anything. Um, <clears throat> the slides that we look at under the microscope like this are generally about 200 to 500 micrometers in thickness. That's a, about a fifth to a half of a millimeter. They're very, very thin. And if you were to cut through tissue that thinly, put it on a piece of glass, and shine light through it, you wouldn't see anything because there's nothing inherent in uh, most of the tissue that we look at that makes it visible. Um, if you were to take sandwich meat, okay, uh, you go to the uh, deli and ask for you know uh, turkey breast sliced for sandwiches, and if you ask them to slice it really, really thin, the thinner and thinner you, they slice it, the easier it is to read through it. Uh, now, of course, at a deli, they can't slice something a half of a millimeter in thickness, but uh, um, you can kind of get the idea. And uh, <clears throat> that's what happens here. There's nothing inherent in tissues that makes it visible. Um, when we can see tissue, when we're looking at, say, uh, dissected, um, organism with the naked eye, what we're seeing in the entire organ is usually the composition of, or I shouldn't say the composition, the contribution of blood to the appearance of the tissue. Okay. Organs that tend to have more blood in them tend to be a darker kind of purple color, like right? um, the liver or the kidneys or the spleen or something like that. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, muscle tissue, specifically skeletal or cardiac muscle tissue, tends to have a reddish color to it also. What makes blood red? So I'm kind of asking that question in, in preparation for what we're gonna be doing in lab by next week, no, next time. Um, but it's also something that has to do with what we're doing in lecture now. Uh, what is it about blood that makes it red? The red blood cells. Oh, yes. Okay, so what is it about red blood cells that makes them red? Is it iron? Right, so you went right to the heart of the matter. Usually, if we were kind of following the question, uh, somebody say hemoglobin, so then I'd have to say, well, what is it about hemoglobin that makes it red? And it is, in fact, the iron. Um, now, it's not just iron. It's iron when it's oxidized. Iron oxide has an inherent color to it, that chemical compound, uh, which is reddish. <clears throat> Outside of a biological system like this, what do we call iron oxide? 
genuine color. Rust. Yeah, rust. And so the color of rust and the color of blood are basically um, the same thing, chemically speaking. Now, muscle tissue, with the exception of smooth muscle, uh, works on the same principle. Instead of hemoglobin in blood, there's myoglobin in muscles. And uh, it has a heme group with iron in it that binds to oxygen and stores it for the muscles, just like um, we see in the blood. Uh, so muscle is a little bit red also. But when we slice thin the tissue very, very thinly, we don't see that. Um, blood is generally no longer in the circulatory system as we're preparing tissue to look at like that. And um, <clears throat> when exposed, hemoglobin or myoglobin is usually going to change color even more. And there won't be enough of it in a very thin <coughs> slice to see with the naked eye. So to be able to see it, we need to add color to the tissue. And we use stains to do that. Now, generally, the tissue that we look at in this course is prepared with a very basic cell stain. Now, I'm going to oversimplify the process a little bit, but again, the concept is, is rather sound. Um, the stain molecule is a pigment that reacts with certain things in the tissue. It has a positive charge to it. So if it's positively charged, what's it going to react with in the tissue? Something that's negatively charged. Right. So just simply, it's an ionic interaction. Negative and positives are going to attract each other. So what's the most negatively charged molecule in any cell in your body? And one way to get at that answer is to think about what you see under the microscope. What's the most easily visible part of any cell? Under the microscope. Plant stain, of course. The cell membrane? No, cell membrane is actually not always visible. The nucleus. The nucleus, right? It's a big dark spot in the middle of the cell. So, back to my original question. Uh, the most negatively charged molecule, um, since the nucleus is what's staining darkest, then it must contain the most negatively charged molecule in the cell. So what is it? What nucleus, what molecule do we find in the nucleus? You're thinking of atoms, atomic nucleus, the cellular nucleus. DNA. DNA, right. Now, DNA is a polymer. The repeating unit of DNA is a nucleotide, and a nucleotide is the ribose sugar, or deoxyribose uh, DNA, and a phosphate group, and a nucleotide, I mean, not a nucleotide, a nitrogenous base, which is the A, G, T, or C part of. A DNA. The phosphate group has a negative charge to it. And so each nucleotide is one negative charge. When we're looking at. Sorry, mine is not. Um, is that your beat? Yeah, I was checking the date and then I accidentally. No, that's fine because the computer makes a beat just like okay. that when it stops recording. And I just want to be sure. <laughs> okay, uh, DNA is a double helix, so two nucleotides are paired to each other. Um, so a base pair is going to have two negative charges to it. Each nucleotide has its own phosphate. How many pieces of DNA are there in pretty much all of the nuclei and all of the cells in your body? <coughs> Sorry, what How many pieces of DNA would you find in the average nucleus in any cell in your body? Singular, not pairs. Right. That's all. 46. Sorry? 46. Right. There's 46 pieces of DNA in pretty much all the nuclei in your cells. Why did you preface that by saying singular versus pairs? Well, because I wasn't sure if you wanted me to say 20 
But what is pairs mean? Why is that relevant? Yeah, so we're talking about the chromosomes, but why would they be paired up? <laughs> well, you knew to ask that question. There's a reason for it. Where do your chromosomes come from? From the parent. So they're paired up because there's always a maternal and a paternal version of each one. Um, there are 23 pairs. They're numbered in order by size from 1 to 22, and then the 23rd pair is the sex chromosomes, the X and Y. Um, and that means that chromosome number one is the longest of the chromosomes. It's about 391 million base pairs long. So I have given you all the information you need to answer the question I'm about to answer it, and I know that it's going to be followed with this shocking silence. What is the charge of a, a chromosome number one molecule? Weren't they all negative? Yes, exactly. How negative is it? <laughs> well, a chloride ion has a negative one charge because it has one more electron than the proton. Wait, and you said that one is the smallest and 23 is the biggest? No, all the way around. No, one is the biggest, it's 391 million degrees long. Right. Okay. So 390. So negative No, because that's base pair. Oh, so divided into two. Not divided by two. Multiply. 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 So it's, uh, I think that's 382 or something like that. Um, negative charge. Now, that's not really how negative that molecule is because a lot of its negative charge is offset by proteins that are bound to it. And those proteins are going to have a, negative, a positive charge so that they're attracted to it, but they're also going to negate some of that negative charge. However, the remaining negative charge after it's well, some of it's neutralized by positive charge um, protons is still quite significant. And so this negatively charged stain molecule will still be attracted mostly to the DNA in the nucleus, and the nucleus stains from the start. What is the second most negatively charged molecule in any cell in your body? Behind DNA. RNA? Yeah. And it's for kind of the same reason. <laughs> RNA is made up of nucleotide just like DNA. It's single stranded, so it doesn't have base pairs, but it's still a, a string of these things. Um, whereas DNA molecules tend to be very long, I told you the length of number one, which is the longest. Um, <clears throat> number 21 or 22, I can't remember, is actually the shortest. Uh, outside of the Y chromosome. Uh, and those are still in the 50 million base pair uh, length. I think the Y chromosome is like 49 to 45 million base pairs anyways. So those are very long molecules. RNA tends to be more in the neighborhood of thousands of nucleotides long. And they're single nucleotides, not paired up. So it's not as negative as DNA, but it's still rather negative. <clears throat> Where do you find most of the RNA in your cell. Mm -hmm. Right, ribosomes are called ribosomes because they're made up of ribonucleic acid. Which is a great answer because that's where I wanted to go next. But I get to follow it up with kind of the same question. Where do we find most of the ribosomes in our cells? Mm -hmm. Um, we don't call it the plasma. Uh, I mean, cell membrane? No, it's inside the cell membrane, outside the nucleus. What do you call that? Cytoplasm. So we don't call it the plasma, it's the cytoplasm. Now, a lot of those will be attached to ER, as in rough ER, but some of it's floating free. And that's as much as I want to get into that it's in the cytoplasm. So when you look at a cell, the darkest staining part of it's going to be the nucleus because of the DNA. 
And then the cytoplasm is still going to stain a little bit too because of the RNA in the ribosomes mostly. If we're looking at two different cells and uh, they both have nice dark stained nuclei, but the cytoplasm in one is darker than the cytoplasm of the other, what can we say about the darker stained cell? Hmm? No, we're just looking, talking about a single cell. Okay? We've established that the staining is about DNA and RNA. The nuclei are where the DNA are, and the cytoplasm is where the RNA is. If the cytoplasm of one cell stains darker than the cytoplasm of the other cell, what can we say about that cell? More ribosomes. Right. And having more ribosomes, what can, can we say functionally about that cell? What do ribosomes do? <clears throat> ribosomes, anybody? You do understand this is being recorded. It's going to be online. Anybody can listen to you not answer this question. <laughs> I'll go ahead and put everybody's name in the comments section and <laughs> links to your Facebook profile. Is that transcription? Say that again? Right. They take messenger RNA and translate that into protein. So a darker staining cell with more ribosomes is also therefore going to make more proteins. Okay. Um, now when we're talking about hormones, we talk about the different types of hormones. Um, probably the majority of hormones that we're interested in this class are of the types that they are proteins. Some of them are peptides, but they're still made in the same fashion. So, talking about endocrine tissue, the darker staining tissue is usually going to refer to the ones that are making more um, proteins and therefore usually hormones. Now, wasn't that fun little trip down party about staining? The whole point to that exercise was because we're going to be looking at slides like we have here on the screen here, um, and we're just going to be comparing the appearance of usually two types of tissue. Um, this is what I sometimes refer to as staining quality, in that I mean uh, how darkly the tissue stains. So we can look at the tissue and say, obviously, there's a darker and a lighter part of the tissue. And that's going to come down to the cells that make up that tissue. Darker staining tissue is going to have darker staining cells. Um, now, sometimes that can be more cells packed closely together, and their, their nuclei are therefore going to make the overall tissue look darker. Or if we're looking at uh, two tissues with kind of the same uh, cell density, then the darker tissue is going to be cells with darker uh, cytoplasm. And again, that translates to uh, making more proteins. <clears throat> so to begin with, we're looking at this tissue right here. This is what we call the hypothesis. And so let me go back to um, this. Uh, hypothesis is really just another way of saying pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is attached to the ventral surface of the hypothalamus. It's below the hypothalamus. Now, hypothalamus means below the thalamus. If we want to generate a word that means below the hypothalamus, hypohypothalamus is a very awkward construction in using Greek roots. So instead, we have hypothesis. The hypo here is referring to uh, being below, and then physis is kind of referring to the hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus is the seat of <coughs> controlling the autonomic and endocrine systems, which is pretty much homeostasis. And homeostasis is a large part of uh, basic physiology. So physis here in hypothesis um, is sort of the root of the word physiology. 
kind of a uh, <clears throat> terribly oversimplified trip to understand that. But that's what hypothesis is referring to. Now, when we talk about the pituitary gland, we talk about the anterior and the posterior pituitary. The hypothesis, however, we refer to differently. Um, there's the adenohypothesis and the neurohypothesis. Um, now, the root at the beginning of each of these versions, the word tells you something about the tissue. Um, what does it mean when a word has the root adeno in it? What does adeno mean? Clay, yeah. right. Um, now, oftentimes, I ask that question, we get that stunning silence like we've been experiencing this morning, so thank you for getting right there. Um, but you robbed me of pointing out that uh, if I had started with the second word, everybody would have been there really quickly. But of course, you were there really quickly to begin with, so we're happy with that. What does neuro mean? Hmm? Not brain, just nervous. Okay. The brain is part of the nervous system. So this is really referring to what type of tissue each is made of. The adenohypothesis is the glandular tissue portion of the pituitary gland. And the neurohypothesis is nervous tissue um, for the uh, pituitary. So back to looking at the slide here. We have two pieces of tissue. There's this big crack right down the middle. Now, in the actual living gland, you wouldn't see a separation like that. That's actually an artifact of treating the tissue uh, to look at it in a microscope. Uh, it's been dehydrated as part of the process. It actually helps stick it to the glass. Uh, but the tissue is going to um, shrink up a little bit. And when tissue shrinks, it'll usually separate on rather natural dividing lines. So that crack there is really between the anterior and posterior pituitaries. Um, now, in the lecture, which when we did with the uh, endocrine system was a little while ago now, but uh, in lecture we did talk about the functions of the anterior and posterior parts of the pituitary. So based on what we covered in lecture, which half of the of the sorry, which half of the pituitary should be the nervous tissue part? Okay, so you're going for what we see on the, the screen, which is where we're headed, which is good. Um, and Charlie, Charlie, you said posterior. Posterior. So the posterior pituitary is the nervous tissue part, which, uh, based on what we see here, would be the lighter stain. <laughs> you kind of uh, got to the next question. Right? Um, now, remember the posterior pituitary is where oxytocin and ADH are released. Okay? They're made in the hypothalamus, but the axons of those neurosecretory cells end in the posterior pituitary to release those particular hormones. So really, the posterior pituitary is just an extension of the nervous tissue, okay? which, uh, <clears throat> looking at these two tissues on the screen, um, would be the lighter of the two tissues. So the uh, neurohypothesis is the posterior pituitary, which then means that the adenohypothesis would be the anterior pituitary. Now, you can remember that very easily because adenohypothesis and anterior pituitary both start with an A. Um, and remember, the anterior pituitary is the target of regulatory hormones from the hypothalamus, like growth hormone, releasing hormone, which tell the anterior pituitary to make their own hormones, like a growth hormone. So we would expect that glandular tissue to be darker, 
because it makes its own hormones. Those are cells that uh, need ribosomes to translate uh, <coughs> mRNA from the genes into their particular hormones. Now, up at the top here, I have these arrows, and I'm just uh, going back. Uh, this is the 11th picture in the cloud service. I'm going back to 10, which happens to be the 10x version of this uh, <coughs> slide. And you can see, start to see the individual dots of nuclei showing up here. Um, <coughs> you don't see them too easily in the anterior pituitary or the adenohypophysis because uh, the tissue just in general stains darker. You can't see the um, uh, nuclei very clearly there, even if I zoom in a little bit. Um, if I leave this figure, because the next one is not the one I want to go to, um, where were we? We were just looking at this hypothesis 10x objective picture. Um, I'm actually going to move down here. I have the adenohypothesis isolated at 10x, which is basically what we were just looking at. Um, and the slide next to that is going up to the, the 40x objective version. Um, oh, I didn't say this uh, in these slides it, for the magnification factor. It just refers to the objective lens that I used, so 4, 10, and 40. Um, I don't know the overall actual magnification here. I've never bothered to measure it empirically. Um, we can figure it out for those microscopes over there because we know the oculars have a 10x magnification factor and you just multiply them together. I don't know the magnification factor of the digital camera here, so I can't immediately tell you what the overall magnification is. It might be using a 40x objective, we might be looking at 400x, we might be looking at 600x or something like that, I don't know, it's somewhere in that range. But uh, Now we can actually see the nuclei of the cells a little bit more clearly. Okay, like this nice big one right here. Um, also in the anterior pituitary, the cells are clustered together. So we can see a rather dark patch right here, and we can see dark patches off to the side here. Um, I'm not positive. I haven't bothered to actually look into this uh, because I'm comfortable with my expectations. When you see differences in anatomy, and when we're looking at the microscope, we're looking at the cellular anatomy. When you see differences in anatomy, it's a safe assumption that there's a functional difference there, too. So to see these cells clustered probably means that they function in little groups like this, which makes sense because in the anterior pituitary, there are, I don't know the exact number, say eight or nine different types of cells based on which hormones they release. And they're probably clustered like this. So this cluster in the middle right here might be uh, <coughs> cells that secrete growth hormone or real in response to GHRH. And these over here might be cells that secrete uh, luteinizing hormone in response to GNRH, which is the gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which we'll study in the reproductive system. And these over here might be cells that release ACTH in response to corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRH. And so they might just be functionally divided based on the particular hormone that they release and the signal that they get telling them to release their hormones. I'm not positive that that's true, um, but it's a pretty safe bet. Uh, there's usually a <clears throat> direct correlation between anatomy and physiology like that. Um, and in setting that up, I'm also to some degree setting up some of understanding why we're looking at the tissue here and looking at how that affects our understanding of what these glands do. Now, what we're looking at here is the thyroid and parathyroid glands. Um, I grabbed this model here, which will not be captured on the screen, obviously, but uh, the thyroid gland is this uh, large structure that's just at the base of the larynx or voice box. Um, it actually wraps pretty much all the way around for this model. They've uh, only shown one half of it. They've uh, dissected, so to speak, at midline so we can see other structures that would be obscured by it. Um, so this is it on one side and would do the same thing on the other side. Uh, posteriorly, here we see the midline, which is not exactly cutting the 
uh, thyroid path. The posterior lobes of the thyroid gland do not meet in the back. There's a little gap between them. Also, the posterior lobes is where are where we find the parathyroid glands. They're very, very small. This obviously is uh, much enlarged from actual size as it is. There are three little yellow dots on the posterior lobe here. Those are parathyroid glands. If we thought about an actual thyroid gland in the size that we would expect to see, those little things would be barely pinpricks. Also, the tissue isn't visibly different to the naked eye. Um, the tissues have blood vessels in them, and they're both going to be kind of a pale pink color. You really can't tell them apart. But for the sake of the model, they've colored them so you can't see them. Um, now, on that model, they have three little dots suggesting parathyroid glands. Uh, there's a, actually a bit of variability from person to person. Uh, if there's three on one side in this model, that suggests there might be three on the other side. But uh, some sources will show you maybe two on either side, so there could be only four glands. Uh, if this model were symmetrical, that would suggest six glands. Um, <clears throat> Other people might have four on one side, maybe uh, a total of eight altogether, and they don't have to be symmetrical. So it could be four on one side, three on the other, two on one side, four on the other, et cetera, et cetera. There's going to be some variability. The exact number doesn't matter. It's really a matter of how much tissue there is. So if somebody has four parathyroid glands, <coughs> they're probably pretty big chunks of tissue, relatively speaking, compared to somebody who might have eight parathyroid glands. So eight small things and four big things are going to be essentially the same amount of tissue. Now, on the slide that we're looking at here, there's actually three different tissues represented. Well, three major tissues we can see here. Um, right here in the middle, this is the thyroid gland. And then the little dark oval off to the side is one of the parathyroid glands. And then all the other tissue that we see here off to the side is muscle tissue. Uh, we're cutting through uh, part of the throat, and so there's going to be other tissues adjacent to what we're looking at. We didn't isolate the glands completely. There are other things in here, like there's a big blood vessel that we can see here, but that's not important. What we want to consider is what the thyroid and parathyroid glands look like relative to each other. So you have all been through AP1. I think it's safe to assume. Um, and so you've looked at tissues under the microscope. The thyroid gland, as you see it here, should remind you of a tissue you studied in AMP1. What tissue does that look like? Parasitic tissue. Sorry? I'm not quite sure what tissue you're talking about. Oh, are you asking for the name of the tissue or a specific tissue? Uh, the specific name of the tissue. What does it look like? Uh, it's like a thyroid gland. Um, this would be adjacent to the trachea, but it shouldn't look like what you're associating with the trachea. I'm, I'm asking what does it look like, not where is it. Transitional? No. Adipose tissue. Right? <laughs> what is adipose tissue? It's fat. And what's the sort of defining characteristic of fatty tissue, adipose tissue? It has this kind of bubbly appearance to it. What are those bubbles? Lipids. In adipose tissue, they are specifically adipose sites. They are cells that contain a big vacuole filled with lipids. Here we see something that looks kind of similar at the 4x objective magnification. Um, if we move up to 10x, now we can start to see the nuclei a little more clearly. And these are obviously not um, within a cell. Um, they're surrounded by some dark staining tissue, which uh, given the scale of the nuclei that we can see here, are probably a layer of cells surrounding them. And if we go up to 
the 40x objective, we can see a little bit better. Okay, um, there are nuclei sort of in a ring surrounding each of these big lipid deposits. These are what we call thyroid follicles. It's a big lipid deposit surrounded by a thin shell of cells. Now. <clears throat> Oftentimes, thinking about what you learn about an AMP1, you might look at that thin shell of cells and think that it's a ring uh, or a layer of cells like an epithelium. It is not. If we saw an epithelium looking like this, say, uh, you might consider this to be um, a single row of cuboidal cells, sort of the best uh, <clears throat> association might make. That would suggest that we're looking at the cross-section of a tube, but that's not what we're looking at. What we're looking at here is the cross-section of a sphere. Um, a follicle is a glob of um, lipids surrounded by a shell of cells. And if we cut through that through the middle, then its two-dimensional surface will look like the cross-section of a tube. But if we move back, then this circle will get smaller and smaller, like maybe this one next to it. And we might start to see some cells, like these sort of ghost images of cells that are coming in. As we're getting towards the edge, we might just shave a little bit off of the cells that are making out the outer covering of this particular follicle. Now, the thyroid follicles have this big lipid deposit in the middle of them because this is where we make the lipid soluble thyroid hormone. Uh, T3 and T4 are lipid soluble. And so that chemistry has to take place in a lipid environment. Uh, the ultimate source of those molecules is an amino acid, which is water soluble, but really only the uh, ring structure, which is uh, hydrocarbon or uh, nonpolar structure, is used, and so that's uh, made into a lipid soluble molecule in the lipid environment of the follicle. The cells surrounding the lipids, that shell, are called follicular cells, and they are the cells that are making the enzymes that are processing the lipids. They also make the proteins that are going to end up being the transport molecules, helping the lipid soluble T3 and T4 actually dissolve in the water of the plasma in the blood. But there are other cells here. Now, right here in the middle of the screen, these cells are not really associated with a follicle that we can tell. Uh, or maybe these up here at the top might not look like that. Now, those particular cells I'm picking out to show you aren't really great examples because we might be looking at the edge of a follicle, um, and we just don't see the lipid part. If we back off a little bit, we can definitely see some regions like over here on the side um, and a couple of places scattered in the middle where there are cells that are definitely not part of follicles. And those are what we call parafollicular cells of the thyroid. <laughs> The thyroid makes three different hormones. T3 and T4, what we call the thyroid hormones, are only two of them. It also makes calcitonin. Um, but calcitonin is just a protein. It's a water-soluble uh, molecule, and it does not need to be made within the um, <clears throat> lipid environment of the follicle. So the parafollicular cells of the thyroid are responsible for making that. Now, very important that you make this distinction in your mind. We have parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland, and we have the parathyroid gland. Both of those start with para, but that's just a coincidence in the word structure. Parafollicular means around the follicles, and the follicles are in the thyroid, so parafollicular cells are going to be in the thyroid. Parathyroid means around the thyroid, and so the parathyroid glands are on the outside of the thyroid. <clears throat> Someday I'm going to actually do this, uh, make a little animation or something. But if I were to capture just the smallest little um, square 
over an area with parafollicular cells and compare it to an equal sized square of cells in the parathyroid gland, they would probably look identical. So if we could just look at this little square right here and an equally sized square right here, the tissues would probably look exactly the same. Somebody been seriously injured? Um, the uh, Tissue that we're looking at there is pretty much identical. The cell density is going to be pretty much the same. The uh, <clears throat> staining quality of the cytoplasm in those cells is going to be pretty much the same because they do kind of the same thing. Whether it's the parafollicular cells of the thyroid making calcitonin or the parathyroid cells making parathyroid hormone, um, they're kind of identical processes. So they're going to look very, very similar. It's just when you're looking at the tissues, as a whole because of all of the um, <clears throat> lipid deposits in the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland looks lighter overall than you see in the um, parathyroid. Okay. And that's more obvious when we go down to the 4X objective image. Um, <clears throat> again, it kind of looks more like adipose tissue than anything else. But um, What we see with the anatomy, what the cells look like when we stain it, tells us a little bit about the function of the tissues. Okay, the lighter appearing thyroid gland because it has all the lipids, it has the lipids because it makes lipid soluble hormones. And the parathyroid gland uh, doesn't make lipid soluble hormones, it just makes the protein hormone and so that it has a more general appearance of um, glandular tissue. Um, now, Here's a 40X objective picture of the uh, <coughs> parathyroid gland. Think about the uh, 40X objective of the anterior pituitary we were looking at a second ago. They don't look quite the same. Um, and I pointed out the clustering appearance of the cells in the, in the anterior pituitary. Um, here we don't see that kind of thing. Because all of these cells do the exact same thing, they all make parathyroid hormones. In the anterior pituitary, we had clusters of cells probably because there are several different hormones working on different uh, <coughs> systems, working within different systems. Okay. So there's some difference in what the glandular tissue looks like, but still it's basically glandular tissue. <coughs> Now, the next tissue I want to look at is the pancreas. Um, the pancreas is one big thing. Everything we're looking at here is glandular tissue, which was basically true before. The thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland are both glandular tissue. They just had some different appearance. Here, we're, again, we're looking at all glandular tissue, and there's some variation in the appearance. The majority of what the pancreas does is actually digestive in function. It's responsible for making a lot of digestive enzymes that are secreted into the small intestine to help digest the food that we eat. That's probably about 90% of what it does. Um, that number, 90%, is largely based on the appearance of the tissue. Um, about 10% of what it does is it makes insulin and glucagon to help regulate um, blood sugar levels. Now, if we look at the tissue, um, most of it is this fairly dark staining stuff. Now, there are big crevices in between the dark staining stuff, which are <clears throat> sort of extracellular space. Again, the tissue shr shrinks up a little bit as it's treated, so it's going to separate on these things. But the surface of the pancreas is... <clears throat> Uh, kind of lobular in appearance. It has these lobes uh, like we see here. But then inside these dark um, lobules of cells, we occasionally see lighter staining patches like right here in the middle. Um, and there are a few other places where we can see the same kind of things. These are what we call pancreatic islets. Now, islet is sort of uh, a word that means little island. So there are little islands of lighter staining tissue in the darker staining tissue. 
Now, I'm going to show you higher power images of these. And really what we're doing is we're zooming in on this particular islet right here, close to the center of this um, image. <clears throat> so this is what we're just looking at. The lighter staining cells in this patch, this little islet, compared to the darker staining cells around it. And here we are at 40x. Okay. Same islet there, but very obviously a lighter staining region compared to what's around it. Now, all of this is glandular tissue. All of this is made up of cells that tend to have a darker staining nucleus and then some lightly staining cytoplasm. The darker staining surrounding tissue stands out because its cytoplasm is much more dark than the islet in the middle. The islet in the middle is what's responsible for making the hormones, insulin and glucose. The darker staining stuff around is what's responsible for making the digestive enzymes. Now, functionally, we would define these as endocrine versus exocrine tissue. Endocrine means uh, secreting within, referring to hormones being secreted into the bloodstream. And exocrine means to secrete outside, which in this sense, the digestive juices of the pancreas are being secreted to the digestive tract, which, at least from an immunological uh, definition, is outside your body. Um, and we'll talk more about that inside-outside immunological definition when we get to the immune system. But effectively, uh, the inside of your digestive tract is equivalent to the outside of the world. Uh, whatever's in your oral cavity might as well be outside the world, uh, I mean outside your body in the, the greater world, as far as your immune system is concerned. And that's true throughout the entire digestive tract. <clears throat> now the reason why there's some staining difference here, now the exocrine tissue is a lighter staining, remember back with the hypothesis of the pituitary, the endocrine gland, the anterior pituitary, was a darker of the two. Here we're looking at lighter tissue. And that's just a matter of how active this various tissues are. The darkly staining uh, exocrine tissue is making lots of enzymes that are going to be secreted into the um, small intestine. Um, you have a lot of macromolecules in the food that you eat and you need a lot of enzymes to break that down. However, the endocrine tissue, the lighter staining tissue here, only has to make a little bit of protein in the form of insulin or glucagon to help regulate those functions. It's not going to be directly tied to uh, the amount of food you eat. Just a signal to all of your body to say that there's nutrient molecules available to be taken up. So these cells are not as active. They don't make as much protein. But they do make protein. We can see that their um, cytoplasm, <coughs> cytoplasms are stained. Uh, just not as darkly as the other cells around. Now, your visual system plays a little trick on you here. Um, by itself, those cells probably look fairly dark. Um, kind of comparable to the other glands we looked at. It's just that the surrounding tissue is so dark that your brain just sort of compensates and says that's light versus uh, the dark surround. <coughs> But it's still picking up a good bit of stain in the cytoplasm, suggesting that it's doing a good bit of work, just that everything around it is uh, doing a bit more. And probably the cytoplasm in the endocrine cells isn't terribly different from the cytoplasm in the center of these clusters of uh, exocrine gland tissue. It's just the edges of these clusters are really dark because there's a very high concentration of molecules that pick up a lot of stain right there. Um, and we'll talk about that exocrine tissue in a lot more detail when we get to the digestive system. Here, it's just a uh, counterpoint to the lighter staining endocrine tissue we see here. Now, in the islets, there are two types of cells that we're interested in. There are what we call endo uh, sorry, what we call alpha cells and beta cells. Alpha cells make glucagon. Beta cells make insulin. 
we have not stained this tissue to actually see the difference between these cells. We'd have to use a special stain to highlight one versus the other type of cell. But as a rule of thumb, the alpha cells are towards the edges of the islet and beta cells tend towards the center. That's not 100% true, but it's a good rule of thumb. If I'm going to point at this cell here in the middle and ask you which type it is, what's it most likely going to be? Beta cell. And if I'm going to point to this cell out here on the edge, it's most likely going to be what? Alpha. That's not necessarily true because we haven't stained for it. We can't prove that. But again, by rule of thumb, that's a pretty uh, safe assumption. Okay. Um, so the fourth tissue, what we've been looking at of uh, what we've been looking at here, is the adrenal gland. And in the adrenal gland, what we're looking at here, again, is staining quality, dark versus light, but we have a bit of variation. Um, we have a fairly light-colored tissue here, which is the middle of the adrenal gland, um, and there's a pretty distinct edge to that tissue, as we can see a border that goes right into darker tissue. And then the tissue starts to fade out to lighter and lighter until we get to this edge here, where there's a fairly distinct border getting into a nice dark outer color. The adrenal gland is separated into two major regions. There's the medulla, which is the middle, and the cortex, which is the outer covering. The lighter stain central part here is the medulla. And then the rest of it, from that very clear edge at the uh, border between the medulla and the cortex, from here out, all of this is cortex. Within the cortex, however, there's some variation in staining quality. We have a very, very dark edge um, with a nice distinct line separating it from lighter cells beneath it. And then those lighter cells start to fade into a darker color. And somewhere right around here, there's a <clears throat> enough of a transition. We can say we got light staining cells here and dark staining cells here. Now, <clears throat> we're looking at this projected up on the screen. Uh, and through the projector, we lose a little bit of resolution. If you look at these pictures directly on your computer screen, it'll be a little bit more obvious that there's a, a border right about there. Okay. But it's still a little hazy compared to these nice distinct borders we have here. <clears throat> now, let me get back here where I can put some words up. Um, <clears throat> the adrenal cortex or gland in general is separated in different regions. Um, the outermost region is called the um, zona glomerulosa. I'm a little touchy on the exact spelling of some of these. It might not be glomerulosa, it might be glomerular or something, um, but that's roughly it. Um, and I want to Mention something about that in a second, so I'm going to leave a little spot there. Uh, the next region is the zona fasciculata. Again, I might have the ending of that word a little wrong. And then the innermost part is the zona um, reticularis. reticularis. Um, <clears throat> now, these three um, layers, and I'm going to come back to this in a second if you're writing these down. I just want to point out the picture real quick. Um, we're talking about the outermost part, that's the glomerulosa, and then the lighter staining region in the center is a fasciculata, and the darker part is the reticularis. And then we have the uh, medulla in the center of the picture, okay. um, which is down there. Um, now, Again, what we see in the tissue, the anatomical differences, usually correspond to functional differences. Kind of like in the uh, anterior pituitary, I was saying those clusters of cells are probably uh, responsible for different hormones and therefore different functions. Here, <coughs> here we see something similar. The glomerulosa is responsible for making 
um, a class of hormones called mineralocorticoids. Now the corticoid ending here, uh, we're going to see in all three of the words I'm about to put up here, but cortic, or corti, I guess, um, <clears throat> comes from the word cortex. And then the oid at the end um, is referring to steroids. So corticoids are steroid hormones from the adrenal cortex. Okay. And we'll see that uh, repeated in all three of these terms I'm about to give you. Um, we have a very st distinct border from the glomerulosa, the outer most part of the cortex, and the fasciculata, which I did not spell right. Fasciculata. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, that distinct border actually points out where we shift from mineralocorticoids to glucocorticoids. Again, corticoids for steroids from the adrenal cortex. Um, <clears throat> I didn't say this about mineralocorticoids. Uh, mineralocorticoids are re responsible for regulating minerals like potassium or maybe phosphates or those sorts of things. Glucocorticoids are obviously going to be responsible for regulating what? Glucose or carbohydrate metabolism. Now, um, <clears throat> insulin and glucagon play a role in that, uh, more about uh, regulating blood sugar levels, but they do that sometimes through carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, this is getting at other aspects of carbohydrate metabolism, uh, but we don't have to get into any uh, specifics there. And then the zona reticularis is responsible for gonadocorticoids. Now, most sources that are talking about this class are not going to call them gonadocorticoids. Um, I'm doing that for the sake of uh, <clears throat> that ending being similar through all of these. But this is what most sources will just call sex hormones. So androgens and estrogens, okay? testosterone is an androgen. And estrogens is a group of hormones, which include um, estradiol and that sort of thing. Um, and then there's progesterones and all those. Those are the sex hormones. <clears throat> um, now, let me go back to the picture for a second. Um, the fact that we don't see a distinct line separating the fasciculata from the um, reticularis corresponds to a functional gray area which is the reticularis is also still responsible for glucocorticoids. Um, so really, there's this distinct line between the glomerulose and the fasciculata where we go from mineralocorticoids to glucocorticoids. And glucocorticoids are made all the way through the rest of the cortex. But as we transition from the fasciculata to the reticularis, the tissue starts to get more dark in appearance which highlights the fact that those cells are now doing something a little bit different, which is additionally making the sex hormones. <clears throat> and then just to round all of this out, um, the medulla, which is where we see oops, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And remember, for the sake of this class, we ignore the norepinephrine part. Um, And that's really because epinephrine represents about 80% of what's secreted from the uh, medulla and only about 20% is norepinephrine. It's a good sized fraction, but uh, it's by far in the minority, so we can kind of ignore it. For the sake of thinking about norepinephrine as being the neurotransmitter from postganglionic sympathetic factors. And remember the medulla, we did be in the autonomic system because it's really a component of the sympathetic response. Okay. Pre-sympathetic ganglionic, I mean pre-sympathetic, nope, said it wrong. Pre-ganglionic sympathetic fibers, uh, synapse in the medulla, and release uh, acetylcholine, where nicotinic receptors cause those cells to release epinephrine, a little bit of norepinephrine, mostly epinephrine. And then that epinephrine binds to 
alpha or beta receptors on the target organ. It gets there through the bloodstream rather than being released, norepinephrine being released at the synapse. Um, but it has the same basic effect. So the adrenal medulla is essentially this kind of weird sympathetic ganglion. Um, and um, it actually is made from the same embryonic tissue uh, that the ganglia are made. So there is actually a, a developmental tissue relationship between the medulla and the sympathetic ganglia. But it acts as a, a gland and releases stuff into the um, bloodstream. So. <coughs> but uh, this just highlights the levels here. I have some additional pictures of the um, adrenal gland. Uh, I have one at 10x showing the border between the medulla on one side and the cortex, specifically the um, zona reticularis. And you can see where the tissue starts to lighten up as we transition into the zona fasciculata. Um, and then I have basically the same image. I just moved over a little bit, so there's just a smidge of the uh, medulla right here at the edge of the picture, but really we're looking at the whole thickness of the cortex across here. Now, as I've been talking about this and kind of simplifying the idea of staining, uh, I've highlighted the idea that um, the staining quality, the darkness of the cells kind of corresponds to uh, the proteins that they make. And most of the tissue we've looked at have been uh, glands that make protein hormones, or the thyroid because of its follicles makes the lipid soluble hormones. Here we're making lipid soluble hormones also. They're steroids. And why exactly one region of tissue looks different from another within the cortex, I don't have a very good explanation. And it goes far beyond the simplified explanation for staining that we went into today. But, uh, the cells do stain differently, which is going to highlight the fact that they function differently. And the function that we're concerned with here is which of the hormones they actually release, okay, the different types of corticoids, corticosteroids. Um, and I don't think I captured a 40x. Oh, I did. Nope, that's adenohypoxis. Yeah, I didn't bother capturing a 40x objective of the adrenal gland because uh, we don't need to look at it in more detail. Um, just the shades of difference that we see across those different layers are important. So, um, any questions about the issues that we've been looking at here? Yes? Can you expect these on the practical? You should always expect these things like this. And that's why I've made this available for you to look at online. We're not going to look at like legit slides of it? Well, no. I'll have these are the slides that are in the box. I'll have them on the microscope, but you can study and look at them. If you'd like to look at them on the microscope yourself, like I said, you can. You can come in tomorrow, sit in the back row while the other half of the class is doing their thing, or you can do it through a file. Book. Or if you want, <coughs> you can come in early before class, uh, before lab. Um, this room on Mondays isn't used um, before us. So I'll be in my office if you want to come in early. Just ask me, I'll open it up, and you can get in here and look at my scopes. Um, and that counts for any day that follows a Monday schedule, but isn't actually a Monday, so uh, there are changes. Uh, which brings me to the last thing, which I don't need to capture and record here. So let me turn that off. Um, <clears throat>